This is part four in our series of lectures on the proofs of theorems involving finite sets. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the cardinality of subsets of finite sets. Here's the statement of the main theorem. It says that if A is a finite set, then any subset of A is also finite. Now, we don't want to start from scratch in order to prove this result. So we're going to make use of the theorem that we proved in the previous lecture, which says that the disjoint union of finite sets is finite. So you'll see that in a very key way uh, that enters into the proof of this result. So let's begin the proof. We're going to begin by proving the theorem in the special case that A isn't just any old finite set, but in fact it's n sub n for some n. And we're going to prove that by induction on n. So for that purpose, it's natural for us to let S be the set of natural numbers, set of natural numbers such that any subset, uh, set of natural numbers n, such that any subset of n sub n is finite. So proving the theorem in the special case that A is n sub n for some n is the same as proving that capital S is equal to the set of all natural numbers. So the first step is to um, show that the basis step is true. In other words, we have to prove that 1 is an element of S. So can you see how to show that 1 is an element of S? Well, showing that 1 is an element of S is the same as showing that any subset of n sub 1 is finite. What is n sub 1? n sub 1 is this set here. And the only subsets of that are either itself, which is certainly finite because it has only one element, and this, which is also finite because it has zero elements. Okay, so that concludes the proof of the basis step. Now what about the inductive step? How would you start the, the proof of the inductive step? Well, we have to give ourselves a natural number n, and we have to assume that n is an element of s, and then we have to prove that n plus 1 is an element of s. So proving that n plus 1 is an element of s um, involves giving ourselves a c, a subset of n sub n plus 1, and we have to prove that c is finite. In order to do that, there are two cases to consider. Either n plus 1 is an element of c, or it isn't. If n plus 1 is not an element of c, then since c is actually um, a subset of n sub n plus 1, but n plus 1 isn't in it, then c must be a subset of n sub n. And now we can use the inductive hypothesis to deduce that uh, c is finite. Okay, so it remains only to consider the possibility that n plus 1 is an element of c. And here's where we're going to make use of the theorem from the previous lecture. Do you see how we can make use of the theorem from the previous lecture? Um, to rewrite C as a union of two uh, sets, it's a disjoint union, um, in such a way that uh, we can handle the case where n plus 1 is an element of C. Well, this is how we do it. If n plus 1 is an element of C, then we can rewrite C as this union. It's C with the element n plus 1 removed, union, the singleton set containing n plus 1 only. Okay, that's clearly the same as C, and it's a disjoint union because this set contains n plus 1 and this set does not. Now, the first set is actually a subset of n sub n. And so, using the fact that n is an element of S, the inductive hypothesis, we know that this is a finite set. This is clearly a finite set, because it only has one element. And so, using the theorem from the previous lecture, we know that that union is finite, and that says that C is finite. So, that concludes the proof that n plus 1 is an element of S. So by the principle of mathematical induction, we've showed that n s is equal to n, and that completes the proof in case a is equal to n sub n for some natural number n. 
Now we have to go back to the general case. Namely, A is just simply any finite set and C is a subset of A. Without loss of generality, we can assume that A is not empty because if A is empty, then there's nothing to do because then C is empty and of course um, that's finite. Okay, so A is not empty. That means to say that A is finite is to say that there exists a natural number N and a bijection F from A into N sub N. Now in order to make use of the case of the theorem that we've just finished proving, we we want to somehow take our subset C of A and produce a certain subset of N sub N because we've just finished proving that any subset of N sub N is finite. So how can we use this F and the C that's contained in A how can we use that to produce a, a subset of N sub N which has the same cardinality as C? Well, what we do is we take the image of C under F. Let's call that D. Okay, so now we've got um, C is sitting in here, D is sitting in here. It is a subset of N sub N, so by the case of the theorem that we've just finished proving, we know that D is finite. But why do D and C have exactly the same cardinality? Well, if we let G be the restriction of F down to C, we know that the restriction of any injection is always an injection. But why is G a, bi um, a surjection? Well, by definition, the image G of C is the same as F of C, and that's D. So the image of C, G of C, is D, and so by definition, G is also surjective. So that proves that G is a bijection. It's a bijection from C to D. So C and D have the same cardinality, but we've already observed that D is a finite set, and therefore C is finite, and that completes the proof. So... The uh, proof wasn't, uh, you know, completely trivial. We had to do some work. But notice that the key idea was here. This is really what made the proof work for us, and that made use of the result from the previous lecture.